Good morning, Harlem Road Church. We're going to get a few minutes head start here and, uh, you know, just engage with the Lord a little bit sooner than, than we normally do. We have a, a big service schedule for today. Our, our service today is about redemption, right? Second chances. And I was thinking this week about my own salvation experience. And I just, I pray that as we sing these songs this morning, that if you've had your salvation experience, that you, that you remember it, that you actively remember what God did for you. And if you haven't had that salvation experience, just please be aware, we have prayed for you all week, that this would be the day for you to step into that place of salvation with Jesus Christ. If you want to stand and worship with us, stand. Make sure you have your phone or if you printed out your, your worship folder. Let's, let's worship the Lord. Welcome to Worship at Harlem Road Church. If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, my name is Rocky Riddle. It's a joy to serve here as pastor. Just a reminder as we continue in worship together and uh, an update of the life of the church here is uh, we do have a spaghetti dinner happening this Saturday. That's going to be a fundraiser for Imagine Missions and help provide school supplies and uh, relieve the uh, relieve the cost of education that it takes Um for those kids in Haiti at Imagine Missions. If you'd like to participate in that, we'd encourage you to check it out at the worship wagon after service. 
Uh, we're in a new series today. It's called Foundations, New Life That Lasts. And Pastor Bud and I and the worship team want to thank you for the ways that you've been faithful in preparing for this series. We really do believe that revival is happening over these over the course of these next few weeks. Thank you for being faithful in prayer, for opening the doors for God to move in our midst today. I just want to invite you to step into the fertile ground that's been prepared. Would you pray with me? God, we give you thanks for all the ways that you have moved, prepared us, led us, and invited us to new life through your son, Jesus Christ. We lift up this worship team for Pastor Bud, the words and music that will be lifted to your throne room today, God. Might they be holy? Might they be inviting us into the ways that you are leading us? And so we take a deep breath. We breathe you in. I just want to be still before you, God, now. Holy Spirit, we know you were here stirring, sweeping over this place wherever we might be. Wake us up to your presence today. Continue to open our hearts that we might see you more and more. Revive us, God.
sure that we keep in mind those who are listed in our celebration folder for prayer requests we lift them up at this time if, if you're looking for a celebration folder um, and you don't have one I'm just gonna invite you to find a guy in the yellow vest um, who <laughs> might have access to one uh, so that we could all participate in worship today let's pray God of revival, we give you thanks for the ways in which things that appear to be dead come back to life in your presence. In you, there are second chances, and you constantly invite us into new life that transforms despair into hope, judgment into mercy hate into love, listlessness into purpose, and yes, death into life. 
You are the one who redeems the broken pieces of our lives into a beautiful mosaic for the world to see. And we praise you this morning that where we are right now is not the final landing point. And that the pieces of our lives that we bring today that we wish were better, more put together, shinier, newer, we place them at your feet and dare to ask you, would you revive the dead places in my life? We hear your words echo in our souls today that, that all have fallen short of your glory and by your grace, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, so that by grace, through faith in him, we might be saved, revived, awakened to the new life that's found in him. And so by this faith in Christ, might we go on to new life so that our old ways would be set aside to put on this new and eternal life in Christ. God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, wake us up. Invite us to the second chance and help us to see all that you have ordained and put in place so that we may see how wonderful how glorious and how awesome you truly are. God, who is ready and able to revive us, we pray for your Holy Spirit to be unleashed in our presence. Break the very bounds of heaven so that we might have an outpouring of salvation in our lives today. May we be more open to you and what you want to do in our lives than we've ever been before. Release us from that which is holding us back and hindering our relationship with you, God. Just go ahead and break down the walls that we've put up and open us to your word and help us to respond in your direction. And God, when we hear you calling us, saying the words, follow me, help us to have the courage to say, yes, Lord, here am I, your faithful follower. May it be so. Amen.
morning Harlem Road Church. It is wonderful to be back in your presence this morning. Pam and I are very grateful for the opportunity we had to take a bit of a break, uh, but uh, we are so glad to be back with you. A great big thanks to Pastor Rocky. I mean, is he incredible and amazing? Or what? Brought us uh, great words. I was able to sit in Mohican State Park Lodge last Sunday morning and go to church with all of you and listened to an incredible message and it was um it was a great experience but it's so much better to be here live with all of you this morning today pastor rocky and i after much prayer along with our prayer team um we have been deeply moved really to open up a new series that we have entitled foundations new life that lasts and in the first three weeks of this new series, we're going to be looking at building or rebuilding the spiritual foundations of our lives. Biblical, you know, three of the most important building components of our spiritual lives really is repentance and baptism and being filled with the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to focus there over the next three weeks. Next week, we're going to be offering baptism. And if you have... Um, if you have questions about that, be sure to contact us because we're going to be, be doing baptisms out here in our parking lot. The whole foundation of this series is founded in Acts chapter 2, and we see the anchoring text of this series, and it says this. It's in your notes this morning. After preaching to a large crowd, the apostle Peter was asked, well, so then what shall we do next? And Peter answered, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. How many times have we talked about promises? The promises of God. Here's one right here that you don't want to miss. So today we're going to build and even rebuild the foundation of our spiritual lives together. Many of you know that about a year ago or so, Pam and I were blessed to be able to move into our forever home. We wanted to have a big party out there, you know, a big pig roast and all that kind of stuff and have the whole church out and party together. And we will do that as soon as this COVID thing is over. But we've wanted to have you out to visit. And, and, and if you've ever built a house, you know that it is a step-by-step, -step, long, long, long process. In February of 2019, when we started, extreme efforts were taken to make sure that the foundation we were building our house upon was strong and supportive and long lasting. See, the reality is there'd be no point, would there? Yeah. There'd be no point in setting a subfloor or the walls or the rafters or the roof or the windows or the siding or any of that stuff until we had a strong foundation you know, what would be the point? What would be the point if the foundation didn't hold it all together and support it? See, the thing about building a foundation on a home is that you really don't get a second chance, a second viable chance to get it right. Amen? You really don't. When you're building a house, it's of critical importance to get the foundation right the first time, rock solid. 
before you build because there really are no viable ways to go back and do it over. I don't know about you, but I thank God through Jesus Christ that we get second chances to rebuild our foundations in him. And he wants us to know that today there is a second chance for all of us, all of us online, all of us here, to make sure that we've got the foundation, the spiritual foundation in our lives set right, set strong. See, if the foundation isn't solid, if the foundation isn't right, and if the foundation isn't true, then the rest of all of this fluff does not matter. That's so clear when we pick up the Bible when we read it because many of the heroes and the great characters of the faith, the ones that we read about and, and we think to ourselves, they were incredibly powerful. They were, they were so on top of their spiritual game, we couldn't be anything like them. All of them were used mightily by God in powerful ways and miraculous ways only because they took an advantage of a second chance that God offered them. Actually, the truth of the matter is many of those Bible greats had pretty sketchy and scandalous pasts. That's the truth of the matter. The Apostle Peter denied that he even knew Jesus three times. Jesus gave him a second chance. Peter went on to become the foundation of the church we know today. The Apostle Paul persecuted believers, and yet God gave Paul a second chance. And Paul went on to spread the gospel news to all the known world at the time. The list goes on and on and on of people who have gotten a second chance. And so today as we begin this series in Foundations, we're going to see that God is a God of second chances so that we have opportunity once again to get our foundations right. See, one thing is clear to me that the Holy Spirit has given to us is that this is a season for all of us to come to this place of taking a reflective look inside at the foundation of our lives the foundations of our spiritual lives as well. And if you're like me, the truth of the matter is, here I am laying myself bare and vulnerable before you. Every once in a while, I find that I'm spiritually bankrupt in a couple of places in my life that need some repair, that need to be resolved and transformed in cooperation with God's Holy Spirit. And it's in those places where we need to drop to our knees and repent and seek a second chance with Jesus. And you know when I say second, you know I mean another, right? I just mean another. Today I want you to consider a guy by the name of Matthew. Hey, do we have a celebration folder up here? Oh, wait. Thanks. Go ahead and grab one of those. I want you to consider a guy this morning by the name of Matthew. This is Matthew, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you will, writer of the New Testament gospel. Writer of the New Testament gospel, Matthew. Matthew was a disciple of Jesus. He was one of the big players in the New Testament scriptures, if you will. But listen to this. Matthew actually had a very scandalous and pitiful history. He had a very questionable character. I think that his story is probably a lot like our stories, if you will. I once was lost, but now I'm found. And yet Matthew's story is a story of God's amazing grace at work. It's, it's the story of hope that all of us need to hear about second chances this morning. And it's a good thing, too, because, listen, friends, if you're like me, no matter how many second chances you might need, God never comes up short in offering us that second chance. So let's talk about Matthew this morning. He's one of the Bible greats that all of us are probably aware of. He was a great that needed a second chance from Jesus. The Bible doesn't have a whole lot to say about Matthew, but if we study what it does say, and if we go back into the history of those days when Matthew lived, you know, we're going to learn a lot from Matthew this morning. For instance, we know that Matthew was a tax collector for the Romans. We also know that Matthew was Jewish. 
And you want to tilt your head a little bit sideways and go, what? Because the reality of that is history and a little common sense tells us about tax collectors in those days. They were among the most hated people in society. And worse yet, Jewish tax collectors in those days were sellouts. They were traitors to their own people. Do you understand what I'm saying? You, you know, the, God's chosen people. And so Matthew is a guy who is making this extreme wealth off of the backs of his own people, God's own people. History tells us that a tax collector didn't even collect a salary, but the way that a tax collector made his living from the Romans was to bid the job out as an independent contractor. The tax collector would go to the Romans and place a bid saying, I can guarantee you that if you let me be the tax collector of this given area right here, that I will bring you this certain amount of tax money from the people who live in this area. Now, the Romans really didn't care how much he collected. They only cared that he collected what he had said he would collect, what he had bid, what he had promised. And so a tax collector could go out and and, and under his own whim and in his own greed, place any kind of an assessment that he wanted to upon the property and the goods and the services of the Jewish people, you see. And as long as the Romans got what they were expecting, then Matthew could keep everything above and beyond what he had collected. So understand, the more he could collect from the Jewish people, the richer Matthew became. And in this case, Matthew was a wealthy, wealthy man. But because of the ruthless and greed-filled way that he went about doing business, he was greatly hated by the Jews. His reputation was that he was a liar. He was a traitor to his own people, a guy who lived only for himself. Greed was his motivation in life. And of course, Matthew would have had the backing of the Roman army, the Roman soldiers as his enforcers, his own personal goon squad, if you will, would back him up. No one could stop Matthew from doing what he wanted to do. He had the power of the Roman army behind him. There were no checks, there were no balances, and no one could stop him from profiting off of the backs of God's chosen people. And though Matthew was one of God's chosen people, and though Matthew was making a pile of money, he was spiritually bankrupt. He had nothing inside. He was empty. A tax collector couldn't go to synagogue. They would create too much of an uproar. A Jewish tax collector was told that, that his prayers would never be listened to and never be heard by God, let alone be answered. Jewish tax collectors were told that they had absolutely no hope of ever receiving any kind of favor or mercy from God, no matter what they did to try to make it right. They were told that there was nothing they could ever do to be made right with God. Their eternal state was closed. It was over. It was done with. There was nothing they could do about it. They were told they were beyond redemption. Think on that for a second. I can only imagine what it must have been like for Matthew. In Matthew's mind, when it came to God and when it came to faith, with his head hung low, he must have said, you know what, it's too late for me. It's too late. Nothing I can do to make things different. I have no chance at all for heaven. I've, I've gone too far. I might as well just get everything I can on earth because when it's over, literally, there's going to be hell to pay. I know people who feel like that today. And then one day, Jesus stepped into Matthew's life. Go ahead, put a smile on your face. One day, Jesus came to Matthew and with just two words, Jesus changed everything about Matthew's life. And Matthew was given a second chance. Take a look in the text that we printed for you this morning. Matthew chapter 9, 
verses 9 through 13. It says, as Jesus went on from there, there was Capernaum. Capernaum, where he had healed a, a man who was let down through a roof. When he went on from there, he saw a man. Say that out loud with me. He saw a man. He saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And on hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but to call the sinners. May God bless his word in our hearts and in our minds that we might own these words for our very selves. Let's talk about what we see going on in here in Matthew's life. Let's see what this encounter with Jesus has to do with Matthew's life. Because it's clear that Matthew gets a second chance. But I think it also tells us that we have opportunities for second chance as well. And it's true that we all need a second chance. See, the reality is we might be able to hide from others. We look good on Sunday mornings in church parking lots. We might be hiding from others. We want to believe that what goes on inside of us is, is fully hidden from the world around us. But I want to tell you, Jesus sees us as we are. He knows. He sees. Let me tell you what I mean. See, I'm pretty confident that Matthew wasn't looking for Jesus on this particular day. <laughs> See, I'm confident of that because like many people, he would not have felt like he was worth Jesus' attention. You see what I mean? I'm confident that he knew who Jesus was. Jesus had been preaching. Jesus had been performing miracles in Matthew's tax area. The word would have been out, if you will. The word would have spread quickly. And so he knew who Jesus was. But I'm confident that he wasn't out looking for Jesus because of his own feelings of guilt. He would have assumed that he was not worthy of Jesus' attention. Feeling guilty does that to us, doesn't it? It does. Makes us think Jesus could never pay attention to me. But it says here that Jesus came looking for Matthew. See, the reality of our guilt moves Jesus to look for us. The text says, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man. Repeat it with me one more time. He saw a man. One more time. He saw a man. I don't want you to miss that. He saw a man named Matthew sitting in a tax collecting booth and said, follow me. There's those two words that changed Matthew's life forever. Follow me. Matthew got up and followed him. That seems pretty simple. That seems pretty straightforward. Jesus saw him and said, follow me. How could it get much simpler than that? But I want you to see there's actually some very profound truth here in these Greek words. Because when the Bible says that Jesus saw a man, saw Matthew, it doesn't mean that Jesus took a, class, a casual glance at a guy sitting over there somewhere. That, that he just happened to notice some guy sitting out there. What it actually means in the Greek is that Jesus turned all of his attention to Matthew. He perceived him. He discerned what was going on inside of Matthew. He understood him. He knew Matthew's life inside and out. He understood his story. He understood his life. He understood his heart. He understood his motivation. He understood what it was like to be Matthew. He understood how other people perceived Matthew. He understood how Matthew perceived himself. See, what is important about this text, Jesus saw Matthew, is to own that Jesus sees you and me also. 
That's what's important about this text. He understands you. He knows you inside and out. He gets you. He knows your heart. He knows your heart's cry. He sees what motivates you. He knows what's going on in your cracked foundations. He sees the flaws. He even sees how you perceive yourself. And so Jesus sees you, but he loves you. He loves you. And he says, follow me. Now, can you fathom the depth of that? I mean, can we get our heads in the depth of that truth? Jesus went to Matthew where he worked while he was there work, working to oppose God's people, to suppress God's people. And yet Jesus loved him and invited him to follow I would suggest there would be no other rabbi of that day who would associate with this tax collector for any reason. Imagine the scandal of being the friend of a tax collector for heaven's sakes. No respecting religious person would ever associate with a tax collector. For heaven's sakes, it would be like a Christian today who would be willing to risk loving somebody who was on the marginal side of culture. Can you imagine such a scandal? Jesus did. That was the way of Jesus. And what it tells me is that Jesus is not afraid of sinners. You know, he loves them. He loves them just as they are. And I, for one, am most grateful that even while I was yet a sinner, the Bible tells me Jesus loved me. Verse 10 says, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners, <laughs> and I got to stop and laugh, tax collectors and sinners, that phrase. You see in the New Testament scriptures, that phrase gets lumped together a lot. Tax collectors and sinners. So many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, by the way, when they saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Why were they so shocked at what Jesus was doing? It's because in their society of that day and very similar to our society today, to have a meal with somebody represents friendship, represents an openness, represents an acceptance, a grace-filled love towards somebody else. How could this holy man, Jesus, be showing friendship and acceptance and love to somebody who is as unclean as a tax collector? Tax collector, it was said, was as unclean as a pig. That's what it was said in that day. For Jesus to be eaten with tax collectors and sinners, according to a Pharisee, was as wrong as wrong could be. And yet Jesus, remember what it says? Saw Matthew. Saw Matthew as he was and loved him. And he was, even as he called him, he loved. I want you to notice something very important in this text this morning that is a great relief to me and maybe to you also. Jesus didn't tell Matthew to go away for a month or so and get his act together yeah. and then follow him. Jesus didn't tell him to go get his act cleaned up and then follow him. He simply called him and invited him and said, come on, come on, follow me. In fact, look at verse 12. The Bible says, on hearing this, this would be the complaint of the Pharisees, upon hearing this, Jesus says, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but to call sinners. So get this, when Jesus is telling them, go and learn what this means, he is actually quoting from an Old Testament passage from the book of Hosea. Now, remember, he's talking to Pharisees. Pharisees are, you know, the religious scholars of the day. These are the guys who would know the Old Testament inside and, and out. And in its context, the book of Hosea, chapter 6, verse 6, God is talking to religious hypocrites, and he says, 
this. He says, your love is like a morning mist. It's like a morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. See, the reality, God is saying, is that I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I desire acknowledgement of God rather than your burnt offerings. When he says, I desire mercy, here's what mercy is. Mercy means loving kindness, good heartedness, and an attitude of love towards someone who is in a pitiful condition. Jesus clearly says, this is what I'm looking for out of my people, loving kindness, good heartedness, and an attitude of love towards someone who is in a pitiful condition. So in this case, Jesus saw Matthew. And he applied this mercy. He saw Matthew in a pitiful state. As cruel and oppressive as he was, Jesus saw his spiritual life in this spiritual pitiful state and extended mercy. And aren't you glad he did? And the Bible says, I desire, I desire acknowledgement of God. It doesn't mean a hand wave. It doesn't mean I'll see you on Sunday morning, God. Here's my acknowledgement to you. Acknowledgement of God means I want to know you personally, God. I want to know you in, inside here. I want to experience you in my life and in my heart. I don't only want to learn a head knowledge of you, Lord, but I want to know you deep down inside. That's what God is looking for. It's what Jesus is saying to these Pharisees, in essence, to you and me. He's saying, I don't want your religion. I don't want your visit on a Sunday morning. I don't want you to come to church out of a sense of moral duty. I don't want you to just learn about me. I want you to learn to love me and to be in relationship with me. I don't want you to quote rules and regulations and scripture verses. I want a relationship with you. Jesus called Matthew himself he called him to a personal friendship and he said come follow me it's awesome to think about you know Jesus sees you and me just as we are he loves us just as we are he calls us just as we are but man, I'm telling you, friends, in getting the foundation solid, Jesus isn't going to leave us alone until he's repaired those cracks. When Matthew stood up and followed, it transformed his life. Jesus said, follow me, and I'll iron out all those wrinkles that you got going on there. It was an invitation to friendship. It was an invitation to transformation, forgiveness, and eternal life. To an utterly undeserving, pitiful man. It was mercy. It was inviting him to a personal relationship and a promise that Jesus would not leave him the same, but do an inside work. The Bible says that Matthew got up and followed immediately. The call to Matthew is a practical picture of God's grace in our lives that is also available to you and me this morning. Church, I've walked with you for many, many years. I don't want you to miss this second opportunity, this second chance. Don't take this lightly. It is another chance to get the foundation right. The grace that Matthew received from Jesus is the same grace that's available to you this morning here in this parking lot. On Facebook Live. In YouTube land, wherever that is. It's an opportunity. Don't miss it. Follow me, Jesus says, and I'll give you a whole new life here on earth and one day in heaven with me. Jesus called Matthew well before Matthew had done anything at all to deserve it, friends. It was grace. It was Matthew's opportunity for a second chance. And he took Jesus up on his offer. Look at this wonderful promise 
uh, I might have put it in your text, I'm not sure, the text from, from Philippians that says, He who began a good work in you will carry it out until its completion. In Ephesians 2, he promises, For it's by grace that you have been saved through faith. And that's not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by your own works, so that no one can boast. God's greatest gift. Second chance at grace and mercy to get the cracks in the foundations fixed is available to you this morning. He calls your name. Breathe in and listen. He says, follow me. It's another chance. Jesus sees you as you are, loves you as you are, calls you as you are, but he is not going to leave you as you are. He's going to help you fix some cracks. And when you respond to his call in your life, the truth is you are never quite the same. Matthew left all of his guilt behind. Matthew left all of his shame behind. Matthew left his uncleanness behind. He left his sins behind. He left his past behind. He left all the things in his life that he hated. And he stepped into a whole new life of forgiveness and purpose. He was no longer spiritually bankrupt or pitiful. He was given new life on earth and in heaven. Matthew became a follower of Jesus and he went on to write what is arguably the most read text in the Bible with possibly the exception of Genesis or the Psalms. Matthew is probably one of the most read books. You know, when, when, when people open up the Bible to read, they want to start in the New Testament. Matthew is the first book. I'm so glad that God gave Matthew the first place in New Testament. Once you get past the first 17 verses there in the family tree... The story of Jesus' life begins to unfold before you, and it's absolutely magnificent. His teachings, his sermons, his miracles, his death and resurrection, and his ascension, all of that we find in the gospel that Matthew wrote. For example, Matthew wrote about the parable of the sower and the seed. It's a picture of how we receive God's word into our lives and how it grows. Matthew wrote about the parable of the wise and the foolish builders. It was the wise builder, he said, who builds the foundation upon the word of God. Matthew wrote the parable of the unmerciful servant. He wrote the parable of the pearl of great price. Matthew recorded for us the Lord's Prayer that all of us have been saying since we were little children. Matthew records the Sermon on the Mount, arguably the best sermon ever preached in all of history. The first line of that sermon, in fact, I have to stop and think back what it might mean to Matthew. It's this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Matthew finally got it. Jesus met Matthew just the way he was, gave him a second chance, saw him as he was, loved him, called him but didn't leave him that way. He changed everything about Matthew's life. Everything. Friends, after hearing about Matthew's life this morning, about how derailed he was, do you really think that you could exhaust God's patience for you? Do you really think that you could exhaust God's mercy and grace in your own life? If you do, then you don't understand the character of God at all. And the extent of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for you on a cross. He sees you. He knows you inside out. And he says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just and forgives you of sin and purifies you from all unrighteousness. And he says, come on, let's do this again. Follow me. Matthew's second chance shows us that 
There just isn't a man or a woman that is beyond God's grace or forgiveness. Not even me. Not even you. And it shows that there is no forgiven man or woman, regardless of their past, that God cannot use for his glory. Amen, Rocky. Amen, church. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite you this morning to make a move. If we were in that church, we'd be doing an altar call. I'm going to invite you to take a stand. I'm going to invite you to get out of your cars if you're able. I'm going to invite you to stand up if you're able. Before we go together in prayer to our Lord. If you recognize the second chance, you recognize that there's a crack in the foundation that needs healing. Get out of your cars. If you're at home on Facebook, if you're on YouTube, stand where you are in your living rooms, on your patios, wherever you're listening. Just as a way of saying, God, thank you for calling me. Jesus, thank you for your mercy in my life. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for Matthew's story of how it shows me this morning that you see me too. All of me. I thank you, God, that you see me and you know me and you understand me and you get me just as I am. Thank you that you love me just as I am. Tell them. Thank you that you call me just as I am. Thank you that you won't leave me alone. chance, another opportunity to follow you. Wash me, Lord, white as snow. If you're here this morning or you're online and you've never even invited Jesus into your life, if this message is speaking to you about things that are going on in your heart, in your mind right now, or maybe you've just taken God up on his offer somewhere along the line, but somehow you have wandered away from your relationship with him and you think you're too lost now? And that is not true. You can take him up on his second chance offer this morning. Let this be your prayer and lift it from your heart to God's heart this morning. Let's pray. Lord, just like Matthew came out from behind the table, I'm standing up right now in a parking lot, in my mind, in a living room, on a patio. And I ask you, Lord, to forgive my sins, to give me a new heart, to give me a new life, and to teach me again how to follow you. Teach me how to live a life that, that pleases you. Speak these words out loud to yourself. Jesus Christ, I receive you today as my Savior. And I thank you. And I pray all of this in your holy name. Amen.
want you to understand if you have prayed that prayer this morning, if you've asked Jesus into your life in a new way to, today, Pastor Rocky and I would love to have an opportunity to connect with you in some way. You know, email us, stop by the welcome wagon, whatever that is. And if you'd like to chat with that, we certainly would like to begin those conversations with you today. And if you found some cracks this morning in that foundation, and you'd like to talk to one of us, I mean, the great healer is your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But in a, but in a step down way. If you want to talk to us, we'd be happy to chat with you as well. Thank you for your ongoing generosity, support of your mission and outreach in this world is amazing, and there'll be an opportunity uh, to do that on your way out uh, this morning. Next week, we're going to offer baptism after Pastor Rocky teaches on baptism next week. Um, I would tell you that when God's Holy Spirit moves upon us, you would be wise to wear your bathing suit next week. <laughs> They're telling me that's bad. It's just a word of warning. The end of the book of Romans it says this God is able to protect you and God is able to make your foundations strong just as this good news says period may it be so may it be so now may the Lord of our grace the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all until we gather again in his name. Amen. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.